As uh, forgotten, Christopher Lund, your host, Dean Williams, my uh, co-host, uh, he'll be turning the letters on the wheel today. Yes. Um, we are uh, going to take a minute, let Instagram catch up to us, and we are going to launch our, I was going to say Thursday show, but today's Tuesday, isn't it? Today's Tuesday. All right, for anybody else out there that's having problems keeping track of the days at this point, uh, don't be afraid to... Uh, Reach out via Instagram or Facebook and let us know I'm not the only one. <laughs> Have you seen that new shelter-in-place clock? No. It's a clock, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> you know, again, i got to thank all the support you guys have, uh, have given us uh, over these, uh, these uh, last bizarre weeks. The wines are going out to a lot of the faithful out there. I think a lot of people are able to drink some of these Elise wines with us while we're doing the show. I, I really, I can't say thank you enough for that kind of support. Uh, you know, like I said, we're all going to get through this uh, one glass at a time. Speaking of which, I'm going to start drinking wine right now. Ooh. Dean, uh, uh, let's start with the 15. But while we're drinking this 15, why don't you talk about why we're here today and what in the world varietal we have chosen for today's yes. adventures. So today is going to be an awesome show because we're focused on Petite Syrah, something that Elise has done for years and has made some incredible Petite Syrahs. We're going to taste... Six feet. Cheers. Six feet. There we go. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> so we're going to taste a uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15 uh, Petite Syrah vertical. And if you're just tuning in, stay to the end because at the very end, the fifth bottle is going to be an aged Petite Syrah going back to 2002. 2002. What was I doing in 2002? Something you shouldn't have been. Well, no, that's not well. Uh, partially, uh, I'll, I'll partially admit to that. The present is any indication. Uh, um, it's really funny. Petite Syrah is a grape. It's one of those things where people are going to always claim confusion around it. There's no confusion. It's just that in, in original turn-of-the-century farming, smaller Syrah in the vineyard was referred to as Petite Syrah. It was just, hey, I just grow a smaller version of Syrah. The actual name Petite Syrah for a grape, um, we didn't really see until, God, right around Prohibition or just prior to that, it actually got its name. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the, the grape in general. Uh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Petite Syrah's relative... By the way, we're starting with the 2015. We're 2015. going to start with the 15 and work our way down to the 02. And while Dean's talking about the grape, we'll explain why we did it that way. Please continue. Yeah, so uh, Petite Syrah's original name was Durif, D-U-R-I-F, and it came from the botanist who created the group, uh, Francois Durif. In uh, 1800, maybe 1801, there's, uh, there's some speculation, 1801, 1802, so just say uh, early 1800s, he crossed a very well-known grape in the world, Syrah, with a relatively unknown grape from the Savoie, Savoie region in France, which is uh, right where the uh, French Alps are, Alpine grape. What are we talking about? If you can't honestly remember where the grape is from, where do you tell them it's from? Savoie. Sure, Savoie, baby. Savoie, Savoie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> everywhere. The other grape in California, we still can't figure out some of its lineage, is Charbonneau. Charbonneau. Which they go, I think it originally comes from. The Jura Savoie. <laughs> That's such a good fallback region, man. But it was also one of those regions in Europe where many cultures crossed over that area over and over, almost like all sauce in the yep. way. It's been kind of raged back and forth over, and so you get a legacy of things there. Exactly. Sure. So that cross was Syrah and uh, that alpine grape called Pelusa. Um, and the reason why he did it, they were having mold problems with Syrah in their own region. They were trying to find a mold-resistant Syrah. We're still on the 15. Uh, yeah, and then uh, you can uh, zap over to Facebook and see all the really in-depth stuff you missed. And the, the balloon sculpture Dean just did was incredible, so you might want to go back and check that yeah, out. It was man. a pink poodle. Uh, <laughs> he did Chris see Pocket. bicycle. <laughs> um... Should we talk about the 15? <laughs> yeah, you know, give me some notes on this in terms of flavor profile, because I think sometimes when people are walking down the shelf and looking for a wine, Petite Syrah seems to be one of those grapes that a lot of people have not embraced or tried, and I think, yeah. I'm not going to use the word fear factor, because nobody fears a beverage other than tequila, but that's a different show. Um, so what is that? Uh, well, one of the reasons why is there's only 10,000 acres of Petite Syrah planted in the entire world. Uh, and that's, that's relatively small. Uh, 
as we already mentioned, it originated in France, but there's hardly any of it left there. Most of it is in California uh, Wait and for it. Uh, Australia, uh, Victoria region, Australia. So what, what makes Petite Syrah so damn good? Color and grip. Uh, it's one of the darkest, inkiest wines you can find and one of the grippiest, in other words, beautiful, strong tannin profile, uh, which makes it perfect with rich foods. Uh, we'll talk about food pairings a little bit later on, but suffice it to say, it's a big, dark wine. And the reason for that, Petite Syrah, they named it uh, Petite Syrah once it came uh, to the Americas because the grape was really small, French Petite. And if you have a small grape, that means a little bit of juice, but a larger skin ratio. And that is where your color and your tanning come in. So this wine has both in spades. Uh, beautiful dark fruit. We're talking black fruit, uh, blueberries, plum. Uh, you get a great smoky quality in a lot of Petite Syrah. Uh, a spiciness, uh, white pepper, black pepper. A lot of these characteristics uh, are why it's often blended into Zinfandel to give Zinfandel more of a backbone, uh, more of a chutzpah. Um, so this wine, <laughs> where chutzpah came from. That was great. Uh, I, I just, you're rolling out all kinds of vocabulary on me today. Yeah, so full-bodied, rich, dark plum, blueberry, a little smoky uh, character, spiciness. Uh, it's a big wine. Uh, just as big, if not bigger, than most Cabernets, if you're trying to kind of put it in the wheelhouse, if you've never had it. It's probably the tannins that most, I would say, if, if you've got a flight of wines, when people get to Petite Syrah, it might be the tannins, where they're like, I don't know if I like that one. Yeah. You know, and that's where the patience comes in, and, and i got to tell you right now, I'm not one for drinking something like the 15 and going, oh, I'm going to let this lay down for five years and let Mother Nature do its thing and soften it. My routine is typically to take something like our 15, and pour it into decanter right away and let the oxygen and swirl it around. When I say pour it into decanter, we're not talking the stuff you see in the movies where the guy with the fancy ashtray around his neck sitting there gently pouring a, a you know a, an old wine over a candle. I'm talking about the California version of this with young wine drinking, which is called power decanting. And don't don't get all whacked out like you gotta do something fancy to the wine. It's just that from a pleasure standpoint, have an experiment with it. If you're gonna open something like our 15, you taste it like, oh baby, that's dry. Put it in that decanter and turn that bottle upside down so you're getting froth and foam inside that decanter yeah. and really pound the oxygen into it and let it go about an hour and then come back to it. You might be amazed at how that fruit will kind of take center stage and those tannins will subside a little you bit. You will be amazed. Know? Yeah, it really is. It's, it's just so for those of us that are impatient wine drinkers, as a grape, it uh, it does respond well to, uh, to decanting as well, which is why we did it this way today going 15, 14, 13, 12. As we taste through the wines and talk about them, the whole idea was we'll kind of see the progression as the grape softens and, and shows you a little bit more of its fruit character uh, uh, with a little bit of time. Um, California's history with Petite Syrah seems to have started, uh, let's say somewhere, oh, what are we talking, 1880s, 1884, let's say. Yeah, you know who brought it here? Um, I want to say it was a guy named Mac MacGyver. MacGyver, not the not the, not the guy that made the bomb out of the ten-speed bicycle. Yeah, no, Dante, yeah, 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 yeah. Charles MacGyver. Yes, uh, and he was of all places in Fremont. Uh, yeah, which was the uh, the old um, Mission San Jose. Oh, Linda Vista uh, the old Linda Vista winery. If you go and see the old photographs of these wineries. I miss that era of construction, these beautiful stone cellars and wineries and the, the family vineyards and everything they did to, uh, to put those together. And it's really funny how Petite Syrah, here it is, one of the first grapes kind of to survive the, the phylloxera. A lot of it did not, of course. But of all the grapes that have come and gone in popularity and everybody's searching for cult cabs and all this, there's a couple of grapes, Zin and Petite Syrah being two of them that seemed to have endured every echo in history that California's ever put out there. Yeah. I mean, we talk about every era of wine in this in, in California, and Petite Syrah shows up in every one of the chapters. So it started out as a blending grape, like a lot of these serendipitous good wines can be, and then when they move locations from one part of the world or one part of the country to another, it might discover all new life. Um, I'm seeing Petite Syrah from the peninsula of Baja, 
all the way up to Washington State. I mean, that is a range for quality wood it to grow. It does well in hot, hot climates. Are you ready for the 14, sir? I am. I am. There you go. Clean your plate off. Good man. No, I am. Eat all the vegetables, Dad. Remember, a bottle a day, that's all we ask. <laughs> I was going to say per person, but let's be responsible. No, you know. It's a bottle an hour. But <laughs> <laughs> What's the, uh, you know, and the other question we've been getting lately is, why is your show at 2 o'clock West Coast time? Like, I would like to, you know, uh, uh, start it at 5 when I, uh, you know, start drinking. And I'm like, well, that's why we started it, too. That's right. <laughs> 8 a.m. in my house. We're trying to grab that East Coast feed, man, you know, because uh, nobody has to switch over from the baseball game, the hockey game, the, you know, uh, the you know preseason football. None of that's going on right now, so. Hmm. This one's a little different. So talk to me about the progression of 15 to 14. Now we're gone one vintage older to the 14. Um, and again, 14, you know, 15, 14, 13, we're going to be doing three of the drop vintages and then get to that plus 12. That was one of our, our kind of better, uh, weather. I wouldn't say better, one of our more reasonable weather years in terms of the rainfall and all that kind of thing. So talk to me a little bit about the differences in this one. So for me, uh, the, the thing that comes right off the, uh, the nose that I didn't get uh, in the last one is graphite. I mean, oh it's, yeah, it's old school pencil sharpener. A little bit of cedar, a little bit of graphite. If you're a teacher's pet, you got to sharpen the pencils, and then yeah. Again, for those of you out there, this is when you actually wrote things on paper and didn't just type it in, wait for the printer to yeah. spit it out. You know, this is old school well, analog. You had you know? Know? Okay, number two. Oh man, I don't even know if those exist anymore. So yeah, so you uh, you still have the dark fruit, uh, that beautiful dark cherry. You know, blueberry keeps popping up. But here, uh, a little more of that, uh, as I said, that graphite. And that'll come out in cooler climates, more so than in the, the warmer climates, like if you head up into Mendo or uh, you know, inland. Eagle Point Ranch up there represents, shout out to farmers up north, you know? Yeah, for me, it's a little bit brighter uh, than, uh, than the previous one. Still same flavor profile, just some, some subtle differences, and a little brighter pop of acidity. There's an interesting band of characters out there as well that I think started to see the nature of the public drinking more Cabernets and maybe more varietals that, you know, Pinot Noir, uh, Merlot got its run uh, for a while. Um, it, it's interesting to see that it took almost an effort to resurrect and maintain this grape. It's almost a historical heritage grape for California. Yes! Question, how do you find the difference of going backwards as opposed to forward in the vertical? Well, we'll let you know as we get there, uh, uh, but some people would always recommend that you start with the softest wine first and work your way to the strongest. For us, what we're trying to do is illustrate the change that the wine goes through with a little patience and the way it ages. So by starting with the fresh young wine, you're getting the building still in scaffold. Then we're going to get it when it's got its paint. Then we're going to get it once it's landscaped and now you can pull your car in the driveway kind of thing. So we're just showing the progression of how the wine's going to change with a little aging, which is why we did it this way today. Yeah, and theoretically, they get a little softer and more accessible as you you go back in age. Of course, there's variations in uh, in uh, what happened that year as far as the vintage. Uh, so a couple of wineries also want to kind of shout out to while we're tasting today, the Fapianos uh, and the Concanons. Uh, Concanon there, Concanon from uh, Livermore, and then the Fapianos out near Healdsburg. Um, these were a couple of the families that have a lot of legacy, God, especially the Concannon family there. In the 1920s. Yeah, they were really some of these early families that championed this grape and were also instrumental in creating marketing groups and creating a real push to, to keep it on the lexicon of wine drinking from California. And for those of us that love Petite Sarah, I appreciate your guys' effort, man. I love that we've maintained some of the heritage vines. We feel pretty blessed to be able to work with some of these ancient vines. Yes, Another question. Another delicious call out. Domain Carneros is watching, and we absolutely love drinking your wine. You can send a lot of it here right now. We'd appreciate it. Two words, Larev, people. Look it up, find it, seek oh, it out. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on the <laughs> extended age. Two words, we trade. The late, we the trade. late Disgorge. That's my favorite. The, the Late, late Disgorge, disgorge man. LD. Oh my God, sitting on their terrace doing a little caviar service and some bubbly. Man. I'm just saying, it's not a bad way to have your afternoon go, man. And then we were just asked what we think the peak will be, and I think that's a perfect question to end on. So I'm going to put that one in our pocket till we get through all the wines. That yeah, we're talk we about get to the, uh, you remember that great dad that, that on the Toblerone used to do for their candy bar? Uh, the 
Uh, anybody do Toblerone candy bars? Remember how the little cardboard it's yeah. a triangle, right? Triangle. So right. the ad for uh, Toblerone used to be, it's better than sex. It peaks 11 times. <laughs> Got me by That's the greatest thing ever for a candy bar, 10, man. You know? <laughs> that was obviously the European version of it. So then but, for someone that joined late, could you also remind them where your Creek Vineyard is? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, AVA is Spring Mountain. So Diamond Creek is at the northern end of the valley, just north of St. Helena, Mayakamas Mountain Range on the western side. Uh, and this vineyard is uh, is planted in that 1,250 to 1,800 foot elevation. So that has a lot to do with the quality and the ageability of this wine. It's mountain grown hillside petite syrup. There's almost an espresso quality to it too. There's, it's really interesting yeah. that you find that right on the soft palate after you've uh, after you've let the wine pass. And this is another characteristic you get when it's not planted in a hot hot area. Uh, if if you cool it down a little bit, like the coast areas are uh, the hillsides, this is when uh, these espresso notes, and graphite, and more earthy notes will pop out. You know, it's really funny. My wife was going for a morning walk this morning and experience the microclimates of the Napa Valley. And we can use that word, but until you physically stand on a hill and feel it. So right when the sun comes up here in Napa, you get the natural reaction. The cold air sinks down into the gullies, the hot air rises. So my wife is walking up this hill in St. Helena towards Spring Mountain. And when she's at the bottom of the hill, it is freezing cold and there's still a little light morning frost on some of the cars. And as she gets to the top of the hill, she turns around and she can feel this warm air rolling, rolling right past her up the hill. And that's that morning exchange that happens. And they refer to that as the lungs of the Napa Valley. The lungs of the Napa Absolutely, because all that heat rising just means it's like it's breathing that ocean air and bringing it off the coast. And when you get to Spring Mountain, especially this York Creek Vineyard, you can have a hot, hot, hot day on the Napa side. And right as you get to York Creek up there towards the top of Spring Mountain, you can almost smell the salt in the air from the ocean rolling yeah. right over the top of those hills and cooling off the rest of the Napa Valley. Another question, yes. Well, so can you name a few other famous wineries that are nearby York Creek if someone was trying to put a pin in where they visited before? Uh, the two most favorite, I would say, are gonna be Pride and Paloma. Uh, really, honestly, uh, Jim and Barbara Richards, God, there's not a day that goes by, I don't miss the two of you. Uh, they were just the absolute funnest couple to, well, all right, Truth be told, Barbara was the fun one of the couple. Jim just did all the work and, you know, did that uh, uh, no eye contact thing in the background. Gotta have you. Uh, <laughs> That's me. And, uh, and Jim and Carolyn Pride up there uh, and uh, Tim Boucher and the crew. Uh, Pride, I could not more highly recommend as a group of people to go drink wine with. Um, my favorite thing about Pride, not only the wines, but they found that their property, uh, right where York Creek is, it saddles Napa, Sonoma. So there are lines where you can be in Sonoma on one side of the line, Napa on the other. And if you go up to Pride as a winery up there, there's literally a county line down the middle of their crush bed where you can be in Sonoma and Napa. Which uh, I think you could there. notice in the Elise wines too. We have wines from York Creek that say Sonoma. We have some that say Napa. That's true. I feel like we can never keep them straight, but we still, we, we try, <laughs> we try. We're one of the few wineries that embrace both. They're, they're, I think there's equal things. I think over the decades, we've also found that varietals didn't get separated by preference, I got separated by by uh, quality of farming. And so by sheer nature of the southern part of Sonoma, you know, Pinot and Chard kind of started to take over. But the northern end of Sonoma, that Dry Creek Valley, is some of the greatest petite straw. There's a rock pile appellation there that grows some of the greatest petite straw in the world. Uh, Kent Rosenblum back in the day championed this grape and that Rosenblum rock pile is one of the most serious red wines of, uh, uh, being made, and I love that it was Petite Sirah. It was one of my hands down favorites for sure. So we celebrate um, a bi-county lifestyle. Absolutely, man, you know. So we just got a question. What are our other wines from York Creek Vineyard? We have our favorite, the Facante. Which Facante! Is made to Facante! We have port varietals in York Creek. We also have a dessert wine from those same varietals. We do, and we also have our delightful 2018 Pinot, Pinot Blanc. Blanc. That's that is right. another York Creek white varietals in addition to red up there. Yeah, only a few cases um, went to that. Well, I guess apparently when you have 300 acres, it's nice. You've got some some options. You've got some variety to plant rather than having to kind of commit. Well, to and I've had a rumor we have a Zinfandel from York Creek Vineyard, but it has not been released yet. I believe that's starting in 2015. Vintage. 16. We did 16? 16. 16. 16 has not seen the light of day yet. Nice. And I'm kind of deciding when we want to put that one out there. It's tasting really good right now. Maybe next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> we have released TV. We've got to fill some airtime. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the thing I love too is when it comes to Petite Syrah, I think um, 
part of the culture of it from a winery standpoint was to try to get people's um, alienation, try to get over that kind of hump, so to speak. So some of the wineries have come up with really great names for it, and they don't call it Petite Syrah. Um, Schaefer being one of my favorites, that refers to it as the Relentless. Yes. Elias Fernandez, that was for you. Um, what is it? Uh, uh, Bialy calls it the Royal Punisher. The Royal Punisher. Now, why is it called that? I don't know. Oh, you I do just, not know this. This is great. great. I love doing this, it's man. It's a great wrestling name. So, uh, his really fancy pronunciation. What's the other great? Pellerzin? What do you call it? Pelusa. 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 Uh, if you take all the letters in that word and the letters with the great Syrah, which are the mother and father of Petite, you jumble them all up and you spell the Royal Punisher. That's exactly where that name came I from. Know that. <laughs> that is some wild Sorry, guys, I'd be all, I hate to steal your thunder. You're greatest storytellers in the wine game. I just there, remember right? that. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a good thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, Dave Finney with Machete. Uh, a machete, if you uh, you know, want to uh, uh, use the local parlays. Um, but I love the fact that people continue to have fun with it. Um, it, uh, it, it has such a legacy to it. And the fact that we can still find 80 to 100 year old versions of it out there still being grown, it grew well, it was diverse, um, and the Elise style has always been to take that singularity of what made that site special, what made Petit Straw amazing there. And, and, and God bless York Creek and Fritz Maytag and the, and the whole team up there for having the ability. If that was a smaller vineyard, it'd be Cabernet. There'd yeah. be no way that they would sort of have the flexibility to let Petit Sera still grow up there. So I love the fact that we have the options and, and could grow higher mountain Petit Sera. Well, face the passion because you can make a hell of a lot more money with Cabernet. 13, 13. the beginning of the drought years, uh, which, you know, some people will look at wines and go and look at scores and look at research and kind of find out was it a good or bad vintage. When you're a small winery like Elise, um, Every vintage uh, is going to present challenges, but it also presents opportunities for you to make great wine in challenging conditions. And nobody in a small winery environment can basically afford to put our label on a wine if we don't think it's fantastic. So even in those troublesome vintages, according to, to press or larger opinion, um, the 13 petites are just fantastic right now. Yeah. Um, and for those of you out there, let me tell you, there are deals to be had right now. A case of this 13 Petite Syrah is going for 20 bucks a bottle. What? Say it again. Oh, what? <laughs> $20 a bottle. That's, that's half price. Yeah. I was going to say, that's almost half of 40 oh. um, We didn't want anybody to run out of wine during these trying times. <laughs> right. We don't want anybody to run out. And some people are drinking the 13 now, so I'm sure they're interested in the notes you're getting. Dean? Yeah, so big earthiness rolls off of this one uh, for me. And 13 was a power vintage overall uh, in Napa. And there was a question before, why are we drinking in this order? And I, I loosely mentioned, well, they, they get softer with age, uh, except there's a variation in vintage. This one is actually bigger than its brother just before it, power vintage. Uh, big earthy notes. So uber plum, blackberry, currant, and just this, uh, I call it the humidor. Uh, it's, you open a humidor, cigar humidor, and you get the smell of sweet tobacco with this little cedar in the background. I'm getting it on this one. And there's a chocolatey uh, quality to yeah. it. Yeah. Um, really complex, a lot going on in here. I always get the um, the oak talking with Petit Sera has an interesting relationship with the tannins. And there's very much a, a blueberry pie pastry crust going on in the backbone of this thing for me. There's yeah. almost a, a toffee quality on the soft palate that uh, that comes through on the finish. Well, so, you get all those sexy baking spice notes that can be pulled from a barrel. Mm -hmm. And combined with that fruit, fruit, it's like pie crust and pie filling. Excellent involvement so then, today, by the way. Another good question. And they had so many people talking about how they just got their shipment. What would you recommend pairing it with? Oof. Oh. Uh, that one word. I don't know, three episodes of NCIS? Don't say yeah. Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> Not say Doritos. That's a safety bone area. Cool Ranch Doritos. No. <laughs> Cassoulet. Oh, yeah. Sausage. Bean. Duck confit. 
Again, Petite Syrah wants rich and fat, and there's not much more rich and fat than... We're going to get Chloe to start well, logging onto these shows so she could fire off what she would pair no, with while the show's Chloe's going on. Chloe's busy doing all of our recipes for later yes, this week. Yes, Chloe! Well, I might recommend to someone with some southern relatives that if you don't have access to Toulouse beans and duck confit, <laughs> maybe you should try uh, bacon and black-eyed peas over rice. Oh, hello. Beans, yeah. black beans, and that's phenomenal. In the history uh, of wine, peppers. is there one thing bacon doesn't go with in the red wine world? Can we, no. no, that's pretty uh, no. good. One. I feel like if I'm getting bacon in my wine, I don't also need bacon on my... I don't know, never mind. Too much bacon. Well, compare contrast is always a good idea. No idea. Yeah. Uh, mole. Anything with a mole. Uh, Interesting. The chicken mole and this. Oh. So typically, when I'm putting a dinner party together and I've got a lineup of wines... Um, Petite Syrah for me is often one of the finales. It is often up there with the Cabernet for that last big giant red wine of the night. And it, for that reason, I've often paired my Petite Syrahs with my finishing courses. You want to break up a little bittersweet chocolate? Uh, we were at the Avondale Golf Club down in, uh, in, in Palm Springs down there in Palm Desert. And I loved using a, a Petite Syrah we were playing with it. We ended up going with the port uh, just because I think that was what the crowd favorite was. But we paired it with super dark chocolate, and it really fabulously yeah. goes with things like that. And I keep coming back to the blueberries and Petite Syrah. If there's one kind of banker factor, Merlot and Petite Syrah both share that blueberry kind of thing, which is why I thought it was amazing that the top of Spring Mountain with Pride and Paloma were Merlot, and then boom, right next to that, you got York Creek, which has that petite, that blueberry profile. Um, so I've often found myself pushing more into the, the later courses with, uh, with yeah. Petite as well. Oh, Especially if you don't savory. Ribs. I think oh, that's a good one. without ribs. a doubt. Because now you bring up the smokiness, which the wine will have. See if they can turn the, the mic up so they can, we can just hear the, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> barbecue ribs, man. Yeah. Yeah. York Creek Petite Syrah. Maybe that should be it. If the York Creek Petite Syrah is finger licking. Oh, that's probably already been taken. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, no, all right. Yeah. Yeah. We can, we can repurpose it. <laughs> uh, cheese. Uh, Three-year-aged Gouda in your Creek Petite Syrah. Oh, man. It's made in heaven. You know, there's also... Um, <laughs> one of the comparisons I used to make with Petite Syrah was... It's like going in for that first kiss and you clack teeth on accident and there's that moment of uncomfortableness. But then if you kind of keep making out, it sort of tends to work itself out, man. You know, like you just get the hang of it. You know? Yeah. yeah. The petite sorrel for me is that first step is there's no doubt, even that 13 is dry after years in the cellar. I mean, here we are seven years later. It is still bone dry. But every sip you take is a progression. Yeah. And the second sip is less dry than the first one. The third sip is less dry than the second one. You see this little progression uh, as the wine builds. Um, Say hi to Jim Zim. Jim Zim out there in, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, because he was talking about ribs, too, right? He, uh, as usual, wow. well, Jim, of course. Jim uh, ribs. beats all trends. Uh, if you want to know what's uh, popular and coming next, just uh, go to Gus's Fried Chicken in St. Louis. Uh, and uh, Jim and Jane Zimmerman will uh, set you straight with the world. Jim sequestered himself in the house uh, six months before anything weird uh, started happening in the world. The Something about double knee surgery, whatever. But I think oh. he just saw what was going on and he got a, a head start on that, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I love it. By the time I got to that third and fourth sip of the 13, it was more round, more balanced, and the tannins had integrated um, exceptionally well. Yeah, your, well, your mouth keeps getting used to it every sip. You should never judge a wine on the first, second sip, always the third. When do I get to judge a wine? Can't judge a wine by its cover. Right. I only judge it by the bottle is either empty or not. That's pretty much my only yeah. score, you know. Like, did we you wake up in the morning as a half of all that was an okay wine. Yeah. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, 2012. 12, all right. All right. And just so you know, the cork on these petites, uh, if uh, if you've got kids in the Little League sports, mm -hmm. open the cork and then just you can give them those little little uh, reflector grease things under their eyes, but just yeah. use the uh, petite syrup pigment on the cork or instead of there. And that's how you spot a gamer. Uh, now, can we do that with psalms in the fancier restaurants? Like, you go in for a night, you open that petite, and just give yourself those yeah. two stripes going like in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a close one today. Gamer yeah. psalms. All right, so this is 2012. 2012. And again, and before yes. Before we even jump in, I always get confused. What was the difference in weather between 12 and 13? I know they're both considered legendary. Uh, one year. Thanks. There's a weather pattern in 12 and one year. <laughs> 
biggest difference for me was I can always tell for Epic Vintages in Napa because I don't remember anything about the weather in 12. It yeah. rained, but not so much. Well, it was hot, but it wasn't blistering, you know? Textbook vintage. It, you know, it really in a, in was. In a 10-year period, you're getting seven, eight vintages of textbook where, you know, why does wine taste so good year to year? There's not a lot of variation in weather, so... Uh, you'll get seven, eight years that are textbook and maybe not as memorable. They're just good wines. And then you get a power vintage like 13 where everything comes together for a perfect growing season. And now you have the stuffing uh, for that wine to age longer than a 12 year. 12 year is softer and approachable oh, in general. I just, as a vintage, it was great though. There was no pressure from heat or weather. I remember making wine in 2012. We were like, do you want to pick today? It's like, nah, we can do it on Thursday. The weather's yes. fine. You know, there was. Good separation from white and red varietals. The reason we bring this up is sometimes when the weather is a little hotter or or we've had higher winds or any of these other weather conditions that can affect us, your white and red harvest start to compress a little more and you find yourself really kind of pushing through these, these long, long days because you got to pick them both on the same day. In vintages like 2012, it was just so even and, and warm enough to give us ripe flavors but not so over the top to, to compress that vintage. And so it really was just a... There's, again, we, we've talked about this in previous shows, um, a reverse pressure in great vintages. Sometimes fruit can show up so perfectly like it did in 2012 where the pressure is not to make a great wine from it. It's not to screw up how perfect the grapes have showed up already for you. And uh, um, this 2012 is aging beautifully. Here we are eight years in and it's, the thing about Petite Syrah is, you know, some wines will start to show their age within 10 years. This is Petite Syrah. I could pull 20 year old bottles of this out of the cellar and we're not really seeing dramatic color change in it. No, it's we're just... about to see whether you're telling the truth or not with that last one. <laughs> <laughs> I love we've got an audience of dissenters here today with us. You can hear, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the 12 is the softest and integrated of the lineup so far. Nothing's competing for your attention. It's dry, but you salivate right away a ripe tannin. The fruit is strong enough to hit that tannin right as a little harmony brings it. The acidity is still noticeable, but the power of the fruit is so gorgeous and well-rounded that that acidity provides a little clarity on the finish and really gives yeah. a, a beautiful kind of linear um, uh, nature to the wine. I really, this is a beautiful bottle of wine to, to jump in on. There are some 2012s left here in the cellar. I will tell you that is that is on our going, going, gone list. It is, it is there's a little bit left, don't get me wrong. Once again, we are not gonna drink wine in front of you that's not available. Do you think it could take even more time in bottle, or is now the time? Without it. I, I mean, you got another 10 years on this. If you like what happens, we're going to talk about what happens when you get, you know, 18, 20 years down the road. The wine you know, evolves, and it is completely different from what it is in the beginning, so. You know better to ask me that question. I'm always like, just drink it now. Yeah. It's well, perfect right now, today. Like, what are you doing later today? I think that's you should why drink I work it at least, because I can't hang <laughs> on to a bottle, but I can find older vintages here. Um, but let's say you pick up a vertical of these. You know, you do the 15, 14, 13, 12. What can really be fascinating for you is if you open all four and taste through them with friends, then an hour later, go back and retaste all four wines again. Yeah, you might be amazed how you might even change your favorite or how the personalities will evolve a little bit for it's sure. It's also a fun thing to just do a blind tasting on if you want to see if you can guess the difference in just a year of vintages. And what um, I always like to do is if we're going to do a blind tasting with Petite, I love throwing a Syrah into the mix. Can you identify, is this physically, can you really feel the difference between the two when you do it blind? Mm -hmm. Just like when we do blind Cabernet tastings, I like throwing them or lower a Cab Franc into that flight. Can you immediately spot that as not being a Cabernet? I just think you like um, chaos. Well, we have another question. Why, why do we have chaos Old Vine Zin and Old Vine Petite Syrah vineyards, but not Old Vine Cabernet? Ah, good question. Um, the reason we have mostly Old Vine Zinfandel and Petite Syrah vineyards because they're family planted vineyards um, that have been in the family four or five generations and become a source of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty whereas, economically stupid to have an old oh, vine farm. Oh, on a spreadsheet, it makes no yeah, sense they, at they all. don't yield very much We like acre. to use the word romantic, be a little oh, right. nicer. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, there, I think what's... It's, it's well, the biggest hard. thing for me was, um, as we're planting grapes in California at the turn of the century, we didn't have Cistercian monks like Europe did running around for a thousand years planting experimental vineyards and developing. Like that's why in Europe sometimes you'll see the village. They don't put the grape on the label. They've been growing the same grapes there for 500 years. Yeah, you buy by the village. By so the you, site. you come over here to the States and we're still experimenting. And, and a lot of what it was was the, the original Spanish missions planted all the Spanish varietals. 
Typically, those are where the Indian uh, uh, settlements were. So the water was good, the food was good, the weather was nice, the grapes really kind of took root. Um, Petitra and Zinfandel were not being grown commercially in Europe, so when they were brought over to the New World, they were not given primary planted locations. All the really great vineyards next to the house and all of that got all of the, the, you know, the Pinots and Cabs and all these other varietals that they were experimenting with to see if they would grow here in the States. Um, Zinfati kind of came later to the party. Now they suffered their own phylloxera disasters as well, but for the most part, the Petite and the Zin got planted in the lesser attractive areas. Rockier terrain above the house, sandier stuff down by the river. Well, the little phylloxera ate most of the sexy vineyards in that really lush soil. Yeah. Well, what survived? Sandy, Sandy soil, soil and the rocky stuff where phylloxera didn't eat, and there's Zin and Petite Syrah. Sandy. Now we get into prohibition. I need a thicker skinned grape that can transport across this United States by train and still make a hearty red wine to your basement. Petite Syrah became the workhorse for home winemakers during that whole era. And you have to understand in America, from basically 1910 to almost 1970, the wine world was kind of a quiet thing out there in California. There wasn't a lot going on. No, we hadn't um, made it yet. And so Petite Syrah survived by A, Easy growability, again, from Baja all the way to Seattle. Um, home winemakers loved it. When Cabernet came along, of course, it might not have been planted in the sexiest locations originally. So Petite Syrah became that little uh, blending magic darling that made it into wines that would give you a little color and a little structure and a little backbone. So as a farmer, if I'm going to plant even a vineyard of other varietals, Petite Syrah was almost an automatic that I would plant because I knew I had a fix. I knew I had yeah. that little, 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 got to set my star so to space. Is, yeah. uh, mess with quality, so if you could throw a little bit of pe pe So that's why it's been around for so long, I think, just by the sheer historical nature of it. So, uh, yeah. you want to, you, know, you want to prong this out? Yeah. Since it's an O2, you want to show us yeah. your technique too? Mm. So sandy soil. Sandy soil. It's my new yeah. stripper name. Nice. <laughs> so one thing I will mention is that Petite Straw is having an interesting comeback in Napa for some of the trendier labels. We're starting to see it being blended by, with Cabernet Sauvignon by some pretty famous winemakers. We haven't made the call to do that yet, but I certainly can't wait to get my hands on some of the 2018s that are experimenting. Without here. a doubt. And, and honestly, I will tell you, I think some of that happened by um, serendipity. Well, I'm not going to say accident, but... <laughs> Normally, you would blend Petit Verdot for that same reason. It's going to bring some color, it's going to bring some structure, and it brings some really fabulous aromatics to a blend. Petit Verdot is still one of the hardest grapes to acquire as a, as a winery that doesn't have its own vineyards. So Petit Syrah can actually play that same role as a blend and give you some of that color and give you some of that depth as well. Um, again, the problem we're having with Petit Syrah is nobody's planting it. So really acquiring your Petite Syrah and getting it now, establishing those relationships. It's not like I can walk out and plant a 50-year-old Petite Syrah vineyard. So really understanding uh, your ability to acquire those grapes, continue to make it. Farmers, again, it's not the most financially rewarding thing to have older vines in your vineyard. But from a historical and a romantic standpoint, the fact that we can still make world-class wine from these older vines is, is absolutely one of the great things about our business. And family pride. Uh, well, without a doubt, man. Yeah. Let's not ever forget the ego role in what we do. We could talk about altruism all day long, but if my ego doesn't get fed, I don't know that the effort's going to be there. <laughs> I'll help feed it. I'll help feed it. Well, you can picture the guy with the shovel, like with the coal and the old, uh, you know, uh, trains going across the states, man, you know? Feed the ego. All right. So we are going into the Wayback Machine now to the 2002 Petite Syrah. 2002? Yes. That's 18 years old. Oh, my God. Almost. Um... This is not going to be the York Creek from Spring Mountain. That relationship didn't start until later on. The O2 is Petite Syrah from Rutherford. And Rutherford, by its nature, had a lot of early development. St. Helena and Rutherford were some of the earlier established areas in Napa for um, more... I'm not going to use the word serious grape growing, but that's kind of what it translated to. Um, prior to, God, 1950... Most of the grapes that we were making into wine were priced according to table grape prices out of the Central Valley. 
Um, and so there was a huge problem with going completely bankrupt. So the Madavis and the Trinqueros and the Martinis and the, oh my God, the Carpies. And if I've forgotten anybody, please let me know. I apologize in advance. You know, the Morisolis, you know, a lot of these families got onto this, this idea. Oh my God, John Daniels uh, from, uh, from Inglenook years that the only way that this was really going to work was to think quality and was to really push the envelope of, of in the early days, we're not going to grow these giant heavy crops. We're going to make so much less money by growing less fruit per acre, but making higher quality wine. Yeah. And it was a really the sound of one hand clapping in the woods kind of move back in the day. But there's not a bottle we open where we don't kind of toast those families uh, from that era to remind us that what we have on our hands here in the Napa Valley is one of the most unique things on the planet in terms of the perfection of the weather for grape growing. And, uh, and so it's those families establishing the requirements for quality and pushing less and less of the bulk concept that we're allowed to kind of enjoy these smaller um, uh, single vineyard wines today. So speaking of, what does an 18-year-old Petit Syrah taste like? Oh, man. Tertiary aromas and flavors, sayings that can only come with age. Forest floor off the uh, not the wazoo. Uh, the I'm color's not, pretty I mean, crazy. I skipped a lot of biology class. Where's the wazoo again? Uh, the wazoo is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just south. Uh, <laughs> the Bell 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 yeah. major. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm color, really thing. struggling to find yeah. color change of any drama. There is it usually you're seeing brick red yeah. around the edges. Uh, it's so. Uh, I'm telling you right now, this it, is dense dark fruit. This still has some grip to it. The acidity is such that, I mean, I'm not drinking this one. Thank God we opened this today because it's not got much life left in it. This is still trucking along. This you know, could go you, another 10, 20 years. Yeah, if, you're, if you're a psalm and you're uh, blind tasting and you get to the part of the evaluation that's color, you would not guess this is pushing 20 years old. It, right. There's very little change around the edge. I, I would I would peg it myself as uh, maybe seven, eight year old wine, maybe 10 at the max. You guys uh, uh, watching from Psalm Select out there, I want you to reach out to us at some point via Instagram or Facebook. Let us know when you guys are doing all your blind flight evaluations, what's your banker factor for Petite Syrah? What makes you know that when you put your nose in that glass, your brain immediately goes, new world, you know, Rome type varietal Petit Syrah. I would love to know your, your kind of decision making process and how you derive at that. Um, this is gorgeous, man. Like, it's, I'm, it's I'm really, I, I just, I'm, I'm not having that experience where I'm like, you know, again, thank God we opened this today because, you know, these aren't going to yeah. get any younger. But, folks, I'm telling you right now, these are absolutely remarkable. Yeah, this is a WTF line. It's like, oh, what? Um, earthiness. You talk about age, earth takes the takes the front stage. That's that's the first thing I get. It's it's damp forest floor. It's wet basement timbers if you grew up in the Midwest and or you've been in a root cellar. The fruit is there. It puts the lotion on. <laughs> <laughs> the lotion in the basket. Now, I'm going to tell you this is the only bad news we're going to deliver today. And once again, our 30-minute show is running closer to 45 minutes. Yeah. Again? There it is. I'm on the metric system. Leave do, me alone. Do we talk too much? Absolutely. Do we drink too much? But... This is the only <laughs> negative about this whole concept today is there is just a little over a case of this O2 left on the planet That's in 750s. We, That's because we took the other case. Hello, lunchtime uh, snackables. Um, but because it ages at such a different rate, there are magnums of this O2 available, and there are at least over a dozen of those that are still available. If I'm going to acquire older wine and get friends and, and enjoy these wines, and these days, I'll tell you how we do it in my neighborhood lately. We've been uh, opening a bottle of wine. We pour a couple of glasses. We wipe the outside of the bottle down. We put it out on our picnic table in the front of our house, call one of our friends and tell them, we just had this great wine. I want you to have some of it. They drive by and take the bottle off of our table and take it home and That's enjoy why it. everybody should be sheltering and never die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying there are ways to still be social with this beverage uh, without violating some of the, the current kind of guidelines for maintaining some civility and this insanity out there, man. You know? this, this could go another 10 years. Easily. Right? Easily. I mean, you're taught fruit is moderate plus tannins are moderate plus acidity. That's key. The acidity is what 
is the difference between a petite Syrah that ages seven years and one that ages 20 plus. This has got all three in space. I can say it's, it's for, beautiful. for a red wine that's this big, I'm all of a sudden on the cedar plank salmon route. All of a sudden I'm thinking of like an oily fish or something that I can play with a little hoisin. Yeah. A little that cedar influence from the, the cooking process. I can go to the ocean with a red one like this one. It's aged this beautifully and it's this yeah. well balanced for sure. This is umami. Umami. Not yours, mine. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that being said, uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of bring this to a hilt, but this is gonna be one of these continuing conversation kind of episodes. Um, we have not figured out what our Thursday show is going to be about yet. We're, we're still kind of banging around a few ideas. We've been kind of holding out on a Cabernet show. Yeah, um, I would love to hear your ideas. We, we would always love appreciate that. some Instagram yeah. and Facebook feedback. <laughs> what would you like to see me drink next? Seriously. <laughs> Besides arsenic. <laughs> What's that? Great words of Socrates? I drank what? I drank what? <laughs> <laughs> so, continue your support. Uh, by all means, um, first come, first serve. Get on some of these O2s because they've got, you know, I don't think they're going to see the sunset today. Yeah. Um, but play around with these verticals. Play around with decanting. Have some fun with it. Do not be afraid to ping us back and go, by the way, I've been serving this with my petite sorrel for years. And we'd be like, oh, my God, I've never tried that. We'll go out and do that tomorrow. And uh, um, have a lot of fun with these wines. And, uh, and come see us on Thursday, guys, 2 o'clock West Coast. Thank Hoorah. you. Cheers. <laughs>